This consists of the primal chuck and the primal rib. Fred Flintstone type of cut. Okay, very rough, very coarse. The first thing that your group will have you do is remove this little muscle right here from the foreporter, which is the diaphragm. What's this, the uh, industry term for it? Skirt. Skirt. Like a fajita meat. Skirt is the most common. It's like a lady's garment. Skirts along the rib cage, I guess. I don't know where the skirt came from. They're valuable. Fajita, Tex-Mex is a huge industry in the U.S. And the beef industry is trying to find every piece of fajita meat they can from carcasses these days. Even some really odd ones we'll talk about later. So once you remove the diaphragms, that's clean. You want to make a break with your saw to separate the chuck and rib. Who can tell me where that is except Eric? Fifth and sixth rib, between the fifth and sixth. Count up one, two, three, four, five. And oops, one, two, three, four, five. And make that seven. Five, fifth, and sixth rib. Close. That's a, that's the closest, best answer. It's one of those historical things I don't really know. We will separate between the fifth and sixth rib, so that then you have a primal rib, primal chuck. Let's start with the chuck. This chuck will then be captured by the shank, and we're going to do this on the rail, just like they do in the large packing plants. Okay? So we'll hang this chuck up by the rail, and you'll come in, and you're going to make some fancy strategic knife cuts, and you're going to pull off a hunk of meat off of this portion right here, known as the... I heard it. Shoulder clod. Shoulder clod. And this is what it looks like. And that's a pretty good one. It's accurate. It's correctly removed. And by today's standards, it's still a hunk of commodity meat. Now, 40 years ago, IBP revolutionized the beef industry when they started manufacturing box beef. And this was, this was a beef value cut 40 years ago. And this was great news for the retail butcher, the grocery store butcher, because now he's not having to lug in sides or quarters and break all that down and throw away fat and bone. Forty years later, you can't hardly find these claws anymore, like this. So this is almost gone, okay? The beef industry, in part funded by the checkoff program, uh, there's a group within CBA known as Beef Innovations Group. And they're the ones that have taken the lead on dissecting these, what used to be value cuts, down into individual muscles. And we'll touch on those as we go out uh, throughout the program. Today, probably the most popular value cut is this muscle right here that sits on top of the clock. Anybody know what that is? Flat iron. Close. Flat iron's right here next to it. This is the petite tender, the Terry's major. And right next to it, Eric, is the other one, the, uh, the flat iron, okay, super spinatus. Second most tender muscle in the whole body. Number one being tenderloin. Number two, surprisingly, see this silver skin right here? That was attached to the scapula. That's periosteum that comes off of the scapula. How many of you guys that work and been out of shape get these terrible knots in your back around your scapula? I get them all the time. I don't know if I don't drink enough water or what. But it's, it's hard to imagine that the second most tender muscle in the body comes off of the scapula because it's a locomotive area. Uh, but it's a function of the body. Very popular muscles that are now being robbed or removed by the packer, and you don't hardly see these claws anymore. So this is a transitional time in the industry. We're going to stop with this, though, for today's exercise, because we still capture price data uh, on those cuts. There's the shoulder claws. That's what it should look like. If yours doesn't, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> this gets very physically intense, okay? The next thing that comes out after you remove that claw is the scapula or the blade bone. It's tough work. We'll show you how to do it. Who I like. I missed the most fundamental of all. I forgot. Let me rewind just a few steps. Before we hang this chuck up, we've got to saw this uh, Uji Bopper up right here. Known as the beef brisket. Very popular cut in Texas and Oklahoma for barbecue. Lots of connective tissue. You can cook it with dry heat and make a great barbecue product. That's called a Packer Trim Brisket. Very rough, okay? We want yours, and I need to find out who cut this demonstration piece. We want your briskets trimmed down to a quarter inch, okay? Quarter inch of external fat. Quarter inch, and that's how we'll capture weights and be uniform across all groups so there's no cheat by the yield grade four group or whatever color cap that is. So, we remove the brisket, that's a pretty easy process. <coughs> remove the clod, remove the scapula, and then the remaining portion of that bone and chuck will lay down on the table and then you get the person with the sharpest knife to start removing neck bones and rib bones. That's a very difficult job. 
Mr. Freeman. Very difficult to do it correctly, and we want you to do it correctly and understand what it takes for the packing industry to convert these animals into product for the consumer. Many times we hold these summits, and I'll be quite frank, we have beef producers from Oklahoma that come in that think the packer is just screwing it to them on everything, and when they go through this exercise and see what the packer has to do to convert that, they have a much different attitude at the end of the program. So if you've never uh, been involved in that, it's, it's a lot of fun to see the conversion process. We'll get the, the 116 chuck roll pulled out of here, set the bones to the side, and the chuck is finished, essentially. A few other minor steps will carry you through. This is the 116 chuck roll, okay? This, that's probably a 20 to 25 pound piece of meat. This is trimmed fairly nice. Uh, the lower portion has been removed, the neck's been removed, essentially. And that, there's your square chuck roll. Traditionally, what do you get from that? Hot roast for chuck steaks. Hot roast for chuck steaks. For years, hot roast for chuck steaks. Okay. This is the next new wave of value cuts the NCBA is now investigating. And they've been working very closely uh, with OSU on that. And we started dissecting or separating the chuck roll into four muscles. There's four muscles we extract out of here. Uh, one essentially is the chuck eye log continuation of the bone screw by roll. One is a muscle called the splenius, which looks a lot like a plant steak I'll show you. One is the rhomboideus, uh, which is the hump on boss indicus or brahmin type cattle. And then there's the serratus ventralis, which used to not be a problem. We could sell all those we wanted when Asia was open because of the popular money <coughs> in Asia and after, med, after BSE came, don't use mad cow, after BSE came, we're left sitting with a bunch of muscles that we use to market around the world. And so we need to find different ways to market those. So the chuck roll is being converted, being investigated, and it's some exciting work. Another muscle that comes off of there is the mock tender. You want to know why it's called mock tender? Chuck mock tender? It's it looks like a tenderloin. If you've ever seen a whole tenderloin or a butt tender, man, you could fool an ignorant consumer. They don't eat similarly at all, not even close. We should change the name of it. Yeah. There is a processor in Oklahoma, though, that markets these and does quite well with them. And if you buy your meat at Walmart, you've seen this. It's the chef's requested, sometimes it's called filet of beef. Uh, it's a chuck tender that's been, had some processing technology applied to it, enhancement, needle tenderization. It's like wrapped in bacon, it looks like a nice filet mignon, uh, but it's not, it's from the toilet brush. Yeah. <laughs> And you pay what you, for what you get. Yeah. But it, you know, it's not bad. If I'm hungry, I'll eat it. It's beef and you can grill it up. And it depends on what your expectation is. Everything depends on your expectations. So there's the chuck right there. There's the line. Those three pieces in the clod. So that's a big hunk and chuck over there. And that's all you get. And these are rough commodity pieces, okay? Keep that in mind. Where's the rest of them? Fat, bone and some trimmings in these totes or lugs down here. But uh, sometimes that's an eye opener. There's your chuck. Next primal, the rib. One of the more valuable primals in the carcass. Essentially, we'll take that down. We use the saw to remove the chine bone and to cut some short plate off of here and a little bit of knife work. And here's what's left over. A lot of fat and bone and a rib eye roll, okay? And the skirts. Actually, the skirts are part of the, the rib of the plate. We pulled those off initially, and I didn't unroll those for you. Again, these are very rough cuts. Um, they're not even peeled. Man, this is embarrassing. But there's some skirt meat. Somebody must have done this late in the day yesterday in a hurry. 112A, ribeye roll. What do you get from this cut? Prime rib. Prime rib? Ribeye steak. Rib Primary roast. Primary roast. Ribeye steak. Very popular item. Weighs about, what's the, well, the weight break on price reports for ribeye rolls? Used to be 11. They come 11 and up, 11 and down. Then those were lights and heavies. Now I think they've bumped it up to 13, which is an indication that the animals are getting larger. Animals are bigger, carcasses are bigger, and so to make that separation between lights and heavies, you don't see any below 11 anymore. 
So now the weight break has been moved up to, I think, 13. We can look at the current price report. But that's an a symptom or an indication that the beef are getting bigger. Remember, this is the same interface where you determine yield and quality grade on the carcass. Hopefully that reflects palatability throughout the rest of the carcass. Beef back ribs, tough to cook correctly, but decent if you do it correctly. And then a few other things that come off of the primal rib. Doesn't look like much. Extremely popular is rib lifter meat or cap and wedge meat, sometimes it's called. Okay? Um, another Oklahoma processor, Advanced Food Company, buys truckloads of this cut for making their chicken fried steak line. They've got 38 different chicken fried steaks they manufacture in Advanced Foods. And they buy lots and lots of rib lifter meat, among other things. This triangle shaped piece of muscle here, anybody want to take a guess? It's a continuation of the deep pectoral. It was part of the brisket. That's where the, the rib chuck separation was made. Sometimes it's called pastrami meat. It's used in special applications. Oftentimes it's thrown in with this rib lifter meat, uh, for chicken fried steak. And then there's a whole host of different things you can do with the short plate of the ribs. These are cut like in an Asian marketing style. We don't know why we do that still yet. We're not selling them. And so the more, excuse me, accurate thing to do would be to remove these ribs, take these, this soft tissue, which is about 50-50, lean to fat, and send it to a grinder, and mix it with some cow beef, and sell it to McDonald's. That's what's happening now. It goes to grinding. So there's a rib. Which one has more weight, Chuck or the rib? Chuck. Chuck. We'll get to that. Here was the break, right here, for rating purposes. 12 and 13th rib, okay? So that interface then gives you the loin and the wrap. About 48% of the carcass. We'll lay the hindquarter down on the table for you, and we'll make a separation between the wrap and the loin, right here. We'll make that break with the saw, and on the carcass it lines up, that separation right there lines up between the fifth and sixth sacral vertebrae and about, see the hip bone right there, the H bone, about two fingers in front of it roughly. You take the saw and you lop it into two pieces. And there you've got a primal loin and round. We'll work on the loin first, and one of the first things we'll do is trim back the flank, take it off and pull out a thin flat piece of meat known as a flank steak. Anyone know any current prices on flank steak right now? It's crazy. Six or seven bucks a pound this day. Oh, it's specialty chef items. They'll, they'll make little pinwheels or there's a there's a <coughs> term called London broil that's used for just about every piece of meat out here on this table. That's the that's the one term that's just overused and incorrectly used. The most popular I would say is a lot of people grill it. Uh, yeah. And you can if you have good knife skills and a good sharp knife, you can actually play the steak into two pieces. Going lengthwise like so. Takes practice, but you can do that. Um, one thing that I find interesting is uh, if someone here goes out and buys a steak or cuts your own steak, how thick do you like it? Some people can't get their fingers that wide, can they? They like it thick. Who's eating in Mexico or into a barbecue in South America? How thick do they slice the steak? Dense. Is there a tenderness problem down there? Not that I've observed. And it's, a, it's all a function of how you cook it and how we measure tenderness. And so you can grill thick. This is a very grainy muscle. And if you throw this up on the grill and try to grill it like a steak, you're going to have some tenderness issues. It's going to be tough and chewy. But if you slice it thin and cook it with a little bit different method, you can make a very palatable product with this. A lot of chefs do that. They might fillet it and then put some uh, chopped sour cream and chives or garlic, onion and garlic, who knows what, roll it into a roll. Slice it, make little pinwheels, throw it on the grill for hors d'oeuvres, and it makes some uh, some decent eating. Problem is, there's only two of these per animal. So that's about, that's roughly a pound. Two pounds of flank steak from a 1,200 pound animal. And so you can see why the price tends to go up if people find it desirable. Now, back to the shot, the deep value cuts. The one muscle in there I told you called the splenius. When you pull that muscle out, ironically, it looks about just like that. 
It doesn't eat quite the same, but it's very similar. And so if there's a particular seasonal demand for flint steaks, that might be an alternative for processors who can convert chucks into other muscles. Very similar in thickness, diameter, dimension. So it might be an alternative, but not from a bull. Remember the spleenius is the muscle that has a lot of test or androgen receptors, and so intact males have very large spleenous muscles. And that's what makes the bull a bull, whereas the rhomboid is what makes a brown a brown. But the two muscles lie right next to each other, and so sometimes people get the two confused. Spleenies from a bull carcass might be impossible. Okay, where was I at? The loin. We pull the flank steak out. Then we pull out the gold nugget. In terms of pride and pound, the tenderloin. And this is one where if you screw up, that's when we escort you out of the building. <laughs> and uh, no, I'm teasing. We'll help you get it out right. At the packing level, those people that remove these get paid a nice wage, very nice wage. They can also lose that luxury if they mis make mistakes too many times. It's a job that people search after uh, because it pays well, because you can really affect the bottom line based on a tenderloin yield for a day. If you fabricate 6,000 animals a day and you add an extra two tenths of a pound to each tenderloin, it's a lot of money. So maximizing yield, the margin is so tight in the packing industry and volume is so high, you have to take every step that you can. Remove the tenderloin. Yes, sir. I have no idea. Maybe Travis can pull up the price of here, sir. I saw retail uh, tenders for CAB in Oklahoma City on Saturday night and they were 18 pounds. Retail, retail steaks? Or yeah. Yeah. Place? Yeah, CAB. CAB. Love it. Now, there is another fabrication style where we don't remove the tenderloin. If you want to market T bones or intact short loins, you would make a break right here between sirloin and short loin before you pull the tenderloin out, and that's how you get T bones. Because the bones would still be in here. Make that break, and then we slice this whole thing with the bones and the two muscles. That's the T-bone steak. When you do that, you're left over with the little short portion of the tenderloin, known as a butt tender, which again looks very similar to the mock tender, and that's where some corruption and identity manipulation can occur. We hope not. Once you eat it, you'll know. If you do remove the tenderloin out bonus, then either way, you're left with then also the sirloin portion of the loin. We've got top and bottom, and that's in relation to the live animal, okay? Top of the animal, dorsal, bottom, ventral. All that you really get from the top is the top sirloin button, number 184. And again, this particular cut is starting to move away from this look and this condition because the packers are starting to remove this cap and further trim things at the packing level as a way to add value and to get it closer to the consumer and minimize some of those conversion steps. They're calling that a cool off. Yeah, the culotte muscle is the cap that you pull off the top of the top button. I don't know where that name came from. I had an argument with you about selling tri-tips as culottes. Uh, you know, a lot of people take this cap and market it like tri-tips also. Yeah. They look similar. They don't eat exactly don't like it. At all. They look similar in, uh, in shape and size and weight. Right. From the bottom circle and then, uh, we've got the flank out of the way. There it is. There's this whole conundrum of stuff that once you remove all the fat, here's the bottom sirloin. We'll pull three pieces out of it. And one Eric just mentioned, very popular in California. Any West Coast people in here? I know. Try to tip. Heather said they okay. Unknown in Oklahoma until a few years ago. Okay. There's another, I keep bragging on these processors in Oklahoma, National Steak and Poultry. Cut lots of these for a little chain called Applebee's. The Applebee's sirloin uh, comes from the tri tip, among other things. The other one from the bottom sirloin is the ball tip. And this, in my personal opinion, is the most frustrating cut. Um, you want to know why? You don't want to talk about the ball tip? This is, if you ever wanted to change something in an entry and it just takes forever to get it done, ball tip is one of those things. It's a continuation of the knuckle. That's the muscle right there, and that's the carcass break between the round and the loin, okay? Now, the reason it's frustrating, number one, is what the heck are you going to do with that? can't cut eggs out of it, the muscle fiber orientation is all wrong, and so what happens most of the time? It ends up getting ground. The last thing we want to do is maximize grinding. We want to minimize grinding for value of whole carcass. The second thing that makes it frustrating is that there's a muscle in there, the mid portion of it, called the rectus femoris, for the meat geeks, the Latin terminology. It's an awesome muscle for steaks, and your steak yield would be much higher if you could leave this thing intact, extract that muscle, and then cut steak out of it. 
And I mean, on the order of I would eat this over any other middle meat, personally. It's an awesome statement, but it's hard to realize because traditionally we've taken the whole, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but we've taken this whole knuckle and cut sirloin tip steaks like you see at retail, and there's three muscles in that group, and they all eat differently. Yeah. One is a function of muscle fiber and how they're laid, and two, it's just a big steak, man, it's huge. So there, there's opportunity for value adding if we could get the whole muscle out, pull the good muscles out, treat the less tender muscle differently. Uh, but getting the industry to realize that cartilage breaks are hurting that value, that's a very slow process. Now, they used to have a diamond cut round years ago. You know, you make a break and you keep this whole knuckle intact. Uh, but at today's scale and today's speed, it's hard to make diamond cut rounds because they've got these big loppers and these big horizontal saws and these animals, are, their cartilage are coming so fast, they're just trying to keep up with the chain. So, at, at, at the tip center is what it's known as. Tip center, the neat little muscle. So, the ball tip, your left, and it's funny, as the price changes, Packers aren't stupid. As the price changes for ball tips, the carcass breaks. Move a little bit. They swing like a pendulum. Same thing down here. As ribeye rolls get expensive or the price goes up, that break between the chuck and the, and the uh, rib. Remember I said between the fifth and sixth rib? Packers, this, I'm, not, I'm not trying to disrespect them. They're just playing the economic game. They'll start off in between the fifth and sixth rib. That cut will start just eating off down the head. you got this big point left on the ribeye roll. And again, at that volume, that's a lot of money because that's probably much better than this. Or if chucks get cheap, they'll, they'll angle that break. And so that's who the facility is trying to operate and to earn a living. The round, the big one. Lots of color, who is getting close to lunch? See lots of color bad up on the inside of that round? Uh, essentially, three, three muscle groups, the knuckle, which I've already harped on, the serve tip for the knuckle, that's the stifle for the livestock judges out there. It's your thigh, quadriceps muscle. It lies on the finger. It's the first one to come off. The second muscle to come off then is known as the top or the inside round, number 168 for the imps people that want to know those numbers. Uh, essentially, there's two muscles in here, uh, the semimembranosus and the adductor. Very popular for a great beef snack item, jerky. Lots of jerky, lots of deli roast beef, round steaks. There's a little processor south of here about 12 miles. They'll take an inside round, enhance it with a salt and phosphate water solution, and uh, trim it up, package it, and sell it to a Mexican restaurant here in Stillwater. And they slice it thin, actually for fajitas or carne asada. They slice it all different ways. And they, I've had it numerous times. It's not tough. It's how you, it's how you slice it how you cook it. And they sell a lot of inside rounds in the Mexican restaurant. The bad one, this is a bad one here, the bottom round. Used to market goose necks. You can't really find goose necks anymore. Why the heck do we call it goose neck? And don't tell me it looks like a goose neck. It looks nothing like a goose neck. I'll debate that with you all day long. Fred Ray is an old retired faculty member from here in extension. Anyone know Fred Ray? Um, he got a call from a Cisco salesman one time, a new, relatively new green rookie salesman. The Dr. Ray, I just had a customer order three truckloads of goosenecks. I've had my poultry book open for two hours and I can't find them anywhere. That's a true story. That's a true story. It's uh, That's a true story. And we hold sessions like this for frontline distributors for their sales staff because to be quite frank, they hire salespeople that know nothing about the meat industry. They know nothing about what they're selling. They just have good selling techniques. So we've got job security here, training uh, salespeople. Now, you don't have a gooseneck, you have an eye of round, and the bottom round flat, F-L-A-T. That's one tough muscle. There's lots of connective tissue in there. Um, it's a locomotive muscle, and we've been slicing this thing incorrectly at retail to maximize tenderness because of muscle fiber orientation. So there's opportunity here for grinding, but again, it's the 80-20 rule. How many of you remember the old cattle pack statistics that said 80% of this carcass value, 80% of the value only comes from 20% of its weight, and 20% of its value comes from 80% of its weight. But if we're marketing on a per pound basis, wouldn't we want 80% of the value to come from 80% of the weight, where the mass is from? And that's why there's a push to add value to the air cut. Always there's that pressure because they're so massive and large and high volume. But the
reason they're so large is because they carry everything in them around their body. So it's just strong the whole time. Obviously, when you do that, you convert some things into trimmings and fat and bone. And those have value, the fat and bone have value very low. Trimmings have value, particularly in this time of year, going in summer, really, really, really.